morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to start my timer here so I don't talk over Jamie's time. Is Jamie here yet? Hi, Jamie. You finishing your slides up? That's why I'm going first? OK. I thought so. Uh, all right. OK. So uh, yeah, my name is Bill Venners, uh, as he may have said in French. And I am uh, going to have to speak in English because I don't know French. Uh, and today, what I wanted to talk about is something that uh, is, uh, it's, it's kind of related to people creating software that is shared in the Scala community. So people designing the compiler, designing the ecosystem of libraries, and then everybody else because uh, uh, lots of people are contributing to all these things. So uh, what the, the situation that we have is that there's a lot of users out there now, uh, maybe half a million users of Scala. Um, Scala test gets about a half a million downloads a month, and I don't know how many users that means, but it might mean that it's half of you are not actually writing tests, or uh, or you're using you know other test frameworks, which is fine too. But um, that's a lot of users. There's enough users that it's actually not so easy to make changes, right? Because it's not uh, software is soft. It's really easy to make changes to it, but if it affects a half a million people, you have to think hard about how to do that, and it makes it a lot harder to make changes. So what I wanted to talk about today was, was how to actually continue to make things better despite having lots of users. OK. So um, before I talk about how, I thought I'd talk a little bit about why. And uh, what I think the main thing we do with Scala is make, try to make people more productive, both by uh, uh, just making it, one of the ways is it it's, it's, uh, provides, it sort of says uh, there's different ways that maybe we should be doing things that will make you more productive. So that's a big part of Scala. And just trying to make Scala more simple and make, people's, uh, make it more obvious how to do things so people don't waste time is part of it. Um, but I also, for me, I think it's a kind of uh, expression. It's a way to, to actually uh, do something that, makes, that matters in people's lives and that, uh, uh, you know, it's just good to do it for its own sake, I think. So I, I think part of Scala's culture is that we keep making it better. I mean, it was sort of started in a research context. It's like, how can we do things better? And I think that's, that's an important part of its culture, is that we're not, just, we're not just about making people more productive. We're also about moving things forward. And so despite having lots of users now, I would like to see that keep going, that part of the culture. So <clears throat> OK. So uh, just to give a few specific examples, uh, this is a tweet someone did recently named Johan. Uh, and he said, in, impress your friends at parties with these subtle Scala, bug, Scala test bugs. Um, and what he actually has a bug in there, because the first three are true, and the second three are actually false. Um, so I can actually do a quick demo. Let me just show you this guy, what he's talking about. And this is actually, um, as it's uh, designed, so um, it really is a user error in a sense, but, but it's, it's an easy mistake to make. So I think that when, you know, it's really my fault, and it's something I would like to make better. And so if you just say um, this, and this is a good demo of it, um, this is a little syntax for, for checking that uh, a double value is within a certain tolerance. It's just a nice little DSL for that. Um, but it's a special case on triple equals. So it's just a special way you can use triple equals. And it doesn't work nested inside anything else. So what this user thought was if he just stuck the, uh, both of these things inside a sum, that that should work. But he got false. Um, and it's, everything is consistent in Scala test. It's, Basically, there should be, should equal, should space be, should space equal, should triple equals. Just doing a comparison with triple equals, they all do the same thing. If it's right there at, the, at that level, uh, you get what you expect. But if you try to wrap it in a sum, you always get a failure, right? And so what he, when I explained that to him, he said, well, it should be documented better. But what I really wanted to do is not compile. Because that's just, that's a bug, so it shouldn't compile. And it does, if you're in a test, it'll fail at runtime. But that's annoying, because you had to wait. And uh, it can be used through scholactic and production code, so you may not notice. It's a way for a bug to sneak in, right? 
So something that looks like it might work should either work or, or not compile. And it's actually, um, uh, there's, there's ways to do it. So if you actually import this guy, um, you get, you'll get a type error where you want it. Um, whoops. So if I go back here and paste these in here. Um, wherever triple equals was used wrongly, uh, you'd get a type error. So if you do that special thing, um, you do, but you don't. So here's the type error, for example. But there's still two cases here where you don't get a type error, and that's a long story. I would like that to be a type error too, but it has to do with it either is too slow to compile to fix that, or we need higher kind of unification, actually. So once we have that, then I can fix that. Um, so that's been, I was kind of not wanting to fix it for triple equals before I fix it there, because that's inconsistent. But um, the other way in the meantime that you can do it is if you uh, use a compiler plugin, uh, that I do recommend people grab when they install Scala test or use it or Scalactic. And I'd have to get out of the REPL here. So when you use this compiler plugin, then it will actually give it to you for everything. Oh, I can just grab it here. Okay, so you'll see now that. Uh, if I say test colon console and I paste this in there, now basically you'll get what I want, which is you get a compiler error for every, every mistake. And so I just would like that to always work eventually. Um, so that, that's an example of, uh, uh, you know, I think it's an example of I, I, I looked back at all my uh, release notes from 1.0 to now. And there's a lot of things I had to deprecate over time, which is really a sign of I, I didn't do it right the first time. And I think no matter how hard you think about it, it's, you're just not going to get it right. And you need to make changes to make it better. Um, OK, so that's one example. And then um, users are you guys. And me too, right? We're all users. So what I think users do is two things. It actually makes it a lot more satisfying to do something. If you actually create something that's really nice, but nobody uses it, then you, it's not as, you're not having an effect on the world. Um, but the problem is, if you have, the more of an effect you actually have in the world, because the more users you have, the harder it is to actually make things better, right? And so I think one of the things that's important uh, uh, for users, for us to actually do it, is you know, they're kind of the opposite of each other. One is, we. If we want to be in Scala and we want it to actually keep getting better, we have to be willing to change our source code from time to time when we upgrade from releases. And we, we should expect that it's very, the minimal that, 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 that needs to be done is people who are providing the libraries and the compiler care very deeply about keeping the pain minimal to you guys, to us. But um, if we want it to keep getting better, we're going to have to fix, we're going to have to make changes over time. And the other thing is, we have to be patient. So they're, they're sort of like users who really don't care about making changes to their source code. They don't want it at all. And there's users who want everything right now. So I think it's, it's uh, to actually do it carefully, you, it takes time. And so you'll have to actually be patient uh, and, and wait for things. So here's an example of that. Uh, here's another tweet that someone tweeted about Scala test. That he says, sum one should equal sum one. Array one should equal array one. But sum array one does not equal sum array one. So that's another uh, by design thing. But it was kind of a compromise. So I can show you that one. This is Alex. Uh, let me cut Alex. OK, so um, what this is is that I think part of it was I just didn't have confidence that I, I should be changing what equals means in Scala. Because essentially, equals in uh, on array, equals calls double, uh, double equals calls EQUALS. And on top of the JVM, that's how arrays behaved. And I thought that was so dumb. I mean, if you say array 1, double equals array 1, it is false. Right, because there's two different array objects. And I figured in a test, you'd never mean that. So 
So, in, so when I made triple equals, I said, well, I'm going to special case it here at this level. But I didn't special case option because I, I didn't want, I just thought that the default equality on the platform is what the test framework should do. So that's why a, uh, if you put something inside a sum, it doesn't look up the array equality uh, by default. But if you want that, you can actually do it. So if you want to actually make a, a, an array a, a, a option equality that is recursive and actually would do this, and that would be true, you can import it. So that was the design. But I do think it's surprising, and I would actually kind of like to fix that. But the problem is, and it's really easy to fix, actually. Uh, I mean, I could write it, and it's easy. But what isn't so easy is that that's a silent killer. In other words, if someone has that in their production code, uh, it will continue to compile but say the opposite thing. Right? So it makes it really hard to make that change. Even though I could just make that change, with you know, hundreds of thousands of users out there, who knows what they've done, um, it becomes a lot harder. So that's, users are like a, a, a blessing and a burden. So, OK, so that's, uh, that's an example of that one. Whoops. OK. So I think what uh, the main thing that we have to do is just when you're designing, like designing that change to make equality recursive, it's not just about designing software. It's about changing users' behavior, about changing the behavior of people, and how like giving the people a path from where they are now to where you want them to go is central to, to the process of design when you have users. OK. So I think the most important thing is this. And this is a nice assertion. Benefit must be greater than cost. Mm -hmm. So w w if you don't have users, it, you can do whatever you want. right? But if you do, to get them to upgrade, it has to be worth their while. So every single change you make, is it worth the cost? So like maybe it is better to have recursive equality be the default. But how much trouble is that going to be for users? So I have to compare those two things before I, in, in, in deciding whether or not to do it. Right? So that's, that's one thing. Does somebody have a question? OK. Um, so I'm going to give you an example. And you guys can tell me if you think this is worth it. So I'm going to switch over to this REPL here. Um, and you know how you can say, let's say, 10 match. Uh, and I'll say case x if x is, uh, let's make it if it's odd, if it's even. 0 equals 2. Uh, we'll say sum x. Uh, Case underscore none. Did I screw that wrong? Uh, I did it backwards. Hang on. You know that was that was that was like a kind of a murmur compiler error. I didn't hear, actually hear the error, but I heard rrr, 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 rrr. so I knew that something was wrong. So let's do it again. Ten match. Uh, case x if x divided by div two equals zero. That's what you wanted, right? And then the, the compiler that that's successful, it's like, yeah. Um, I'm going to say some x. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to say none. OK. Voila. So uh, now, if you want to do that just with an if, I could say if uh, x, uh, I'll say 10 on this case. Well, I say val x equals 10 if x div. Um, 2 equals 0, sum x, else none. OK, that's another way to write it. And what is um, inconsistent here, and this is something Martin Odersky regrets, is that you have to put prints around the, the expression for the if when you use if in an expression. But when you use it in a, as a guard, you don't. Right? So like right here, I'm going to highlight it. I have to put prints here, but I don't have to put them here. And it makes the language grammar more complex. So he looks at that and thinks, ah, I wish I had, had done something different. And what he wishes he did was this. And this is probably a pretty easy change to make in the compiler. But and you know, it's actually, then this is dotty. So then is a keyword in dotty, but they forgot to highlight it because maybe they're not sure if they're going to actually do this. And so this is what I want to ask you. So this is an easy change to make. Is this worth 
it because you would have to go through your code and change all of your places where you use if. And I'm not sure if you use if, but if you do, you're going to have to change it to that. So I just had a show of hands. How many people would like to see Scala make that change over time? OK, how many would, would not? OK, all right, so that's about even. I think there's like, I would say one fifth are for it, one fifth against it, and one person has a question. Yes? And so that, that, I'm not sure that's a great example because that's really, really easy to mitigate. I mean, you can easily support both syntaxes. I mean, the, the hard change is the semantic ones. Yeah. Like, for example, the one with the, the, the distinction between uh, single level and multi level. Right. This, yep. this, is, this is easy to support both options at once. OK. So you could support both options at once. How many would people would like to see one or the other? How many people would like to see both of them in there? Oh, that's interesting. So I actually would, I would rather see both of them there for a while, but you either pick one. So you would pick the then one. But you could do it for a very long time, and it would need to be a very long time. But it's really a, a case of, it does make it simpler, I think. It makes it more consistent, and consistency is simplicity. Simplicity helps people be productive. So I think it would be better. Um, but, and it's also benefit greater than cost. The benefit is kind of small, but if you made the cost small, because just a, a textual change could be automated. If you can make that automated and, and guarantee that it would work, you run this process through your code, your code through this process and it's done, then, uh, then I think it could be still passing that thing. But what happened with this one is, uh, years ago, they actually deprecated then as a keyword, uh, then as a non-keyword then as an identifier. And that affected tons and tons and tons of Scala test users because everybody was, was doing, using this kind of thing in feature spec where they have given when then and then there it is right there, fourth four from the bottom is that thing that was not allowed to be used as an identifier. So I was like, are you sure you're ever gonna do this? Because if you're never gonna do the if then thing, then you don't need to deprecate the keyword. I don't need to bother my users, right? Uh, but they, 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 they did it, so I had to do this and make everybody rewrite all their test code. And so I, I did that, and it actually, no one really complained because I could blame it on Martin, right? It wasn't my fault. Um, but then I didn't like it because now I have something inconsistent. I have little f, little s, and big G, big W, big T, right? But I didn't know what else to do. And later, I realized that, you know, in the output, I have capital F, capital S, capital G, capital W. You know, it actually looks more like the output now. And then even in Gherkin, this is the, the cucumber input that this, was, this feature spec was uh, inspired by, they also have capital letters. So what I thought is, oh, you know what I should have done? Was I should have, when I changed G, W, and T, I should have made F and S capital, and then it would kind of be consistent again. Um, but now I can't blame it on Martin. But it's again, I kind of want to do that. And it's like, is that worth it? You know, I think it's only worth it if I can help automate the process. Um, but I do think that, you know, that's the kind, of, the kind of thing you have to think about. So, okay, so another thing is, Version numbers should be promises. And, and uh, so I think everybody's project can kind of come up with their own uh, level of promise. But what I do for Scala test uh, is, I can just show you maybe in the, I'm gonna go back to this one. If I say val version equals 3.4.5, uh, 3.4.5, whoops. Put, okay, so that's my version number. Three is the major version, right? Uh, four is minor, and uh, five is uh, patch, let's call it. <clears throat> so what I promised in Scala Test and Scalactic is that if I change a patch number, it's binary compatible in the back, it's backwards compatible, not both directions, but, but one way. And the, the Scala compiler folks promise in both ways, binary compatible. Um, the minor version, if that changes, is actually source compatible. So you can just upgrade, but you may get deprecation warnings. And I am allowed to, and I do allow myself to, change, to break code in a minor version if it had been through a deprecation cycle. So when you actually expire a deprecation and just remove something that's been deprecated, then that is a source breaking change. But if it's gone through that, I allow to do it in the minor one. And otherwise, I do it in the major one, which I've only had two of those so far. Um, so that's what I promise, and so I want to show you an example of, uh, uh, of a, a problem that I just, a very recent problem, is in 3.0, I did something for this guy, Sam, because he does a lot of open source and he's kind of a loud squeaky wheel, so I gave, you know, I gave him some, some solution. Um, what he wanted, because he's working on Enzyme, 
and he uses Emacs. And in Emacs, he needs a full path name to the source file that has the error. All the other IDs don't need that. They just deal with the simple name, they find it. Um, but if you have two source files with the same simple name, fred.scala, then I'm not sure how they disambiguate it, but it's pretty rare that happens. But he says, well, no, I just actually want the entire full path name. So, uh, and he was very happy with that. That came out in August, just this year. Um, and the way we did it was this thing called position, which we had to put this in for Scala.js support anyway. Uh, so while I was putting it in, it says, hey, you know what, I'll insert the full path name, I called file path name, in there as well, and that'll take care of that user request. Um, so what a position is, is there's a macro here. So let me show you a quick demo of that. Um, what it is, and this is actually down here in the, um, I'll show you, I'm gonna go down to source main Scala, and VI, what's it called, example. So here's, here's just some Scala code, and I have a method called position here that returns a source position, and it just says source position here. So source position here is a macro that will, will do the following. So if I say example dot, what was it? Sorry, I forgot the name of it, position here. Okay, so basically this guy, um, val pose equals, gives me a position, and if I say pose dot, a file name, uh, it gives me example dot scala, that's nice. So if I say line number, it tells me line five, which is what it is. And the reason I had to do this in a source file is if I go here to this line, you see it's line five. Okay, so it tells you where it was. And then <coughs> file path name, and Miles, you can't answer this question because you know the answer already, um, gives me the fully qualified path name. So that, that's what made uh, Sam so happy. Um, so I released this in August. I would say in probably late September, about five weeks later, I got an email from a large bank, a very large user of Scala, saying I broke their build. So the puzzle for, for people who haven't seen the, like, the issue and what that was about, just can you see anything wrong with this? I mean, how did I break someone's build? And this is like a big, important Scala user whose build I broke. Um, can anybody guess? Because I didn't see it, obviously. I didn't see it coming. But in, since then, I've actually found another thing to complain about with it. And I'll give you a hint as the, the thing to complain about, uh, the, the second thing. What if you were mad at your coworker and you made a directory name you know, my coworker is, is really stupid, right? And you put your, your clone in there, you clone the repo in there and you do the build. It turns out that, you know, my coworker is stupid will show up in the binaries of your build, right? So it's kind of like maybe personal information that I'm leaking out the door. So that's one bad thing, I think. So what, how, how can anybody think how that might have affected, how might, that might have broken somebody's build? Yeah, it, it was not obvious to me, obviously, because I wouldn't have done it this way, but, what happened is there's, there's a, a, a place that does reproducible builds, even of their tests. And so the way they do that is they've automated a test to make sure they can do reproducible builds, but they'll check out the repository automatically in some temporary directory whose name is made up at the time, do a build, check it out again, do another build in a different temporary directory, and compare the binaries to make sure they're identical. Right? And now they have this difference in them. Uh, because that goes in the class file. Um, so I realized after that that what I should have done in August was make that file path name an option of string, not a string, and you have to actually enable this feature with a uh, environment variable set. So by default it will be off and you'll get a none, right? The trouble is that it's 3.0, right? That's a breaking change. I really can't do that till 4.0 even though I've discovered it five weeks later, if I'm going to keep my promise. So I can either break my promise, say, ah, oh, it's so fast, I'll do it real quick. Uh, or I figure out some way to keep it. And um, what I decided I'm going to do is just, in 3.1, we'll have that environment variable. And if it's not set, we'll put a, a sort of an error message in the string saying, if you want to see the actual file name, <laughs> set this environment variable. And that will be the same every time. And then I, in 4.0, when th that day comes, we'll change it to an option. So. So anyway, I think, you know, it, it, you don't always have to keep your promises. You know, things depend on the situation. But I think what's good for, for people at this point in the, in, you know, the evolution of Scala, with people creating libraries, is decide what your version number means and then keep your promise. 
Okay, so that's one more. And then um, deprecation, I think, is, is a way to get people to make it easier to upgrade. You can upgrade, get the new features, and fix things later that are changing. So I think that's uh, very useful to do. Um, and then eventually remove it. So like Java never did the second part. And I think if you don't do that, then people never have uh, trouble, but they, um, you actually get less productivity because there's a cruft accumulates over time. So I think that's an important part of Scala's, uh, again, philosophy or culture, that we do actually remove things eventually once we decide we want to do it a different way is better. So um, this, is an this is the expired deprecations from 3.0, and all these things were in, I think almost all of them, were since 2.0, which is normally I deprecate for, from one to two years before I remove it. So, and the, the compiler team, uh, the Scala compiler team, does 18-month deprecation cycles. So I think that's about the, the, the time you should try to deprecate things. Um, so it's not too long, not too short. Um, and the main thing is no sign of closure, which what, what Miles was talking about, where you're changing the behavior silently. So if I just change what sum array one, triple equals sum array one means, used to mean false, now means true, then that could cause a, you know, a, a, a space probe to crash into a planet, right? And then I would, that's a problem. So I think that is a real drag on progress because sometimes there's no way to make progress, like making implicit search simpler. To, if you can't guarantee that you're not going to like break code in surprising ways. You just almost can't do it anymore because there's too many users. Um, so I think one of the things there is um, that you, you can uh, sometimes do it if you think it's never going to actually matter. Like if, if uh, a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it, it does, does it make a sound? So I have in the past done things that are technically silent killers that I didn't think and it would actually affect anyone. Like in 1.41, I realized I actually didn't do the thing with arrays on triple equals, but I did it on should triple equals, which was inconsistent again, and I wanted to fix it. And there was really no good way to deprecate that. So I just did it because I figured no one would actually have that code because it would have failed at the test, and they would have fixed it. So I think in practice, it, even though technically that was a silent killer, it probably actually didn't t affect any code. Um, but the other thing is to make it not silent. So if <laughs> If there was a tool that you could give, and that's my next one, which is we should maybe also try to innovate on migration tools. So if there was a tool that would go and say, oh, well, this one is, I mean, it would compile, but I, my, my, this compiler plugin finds that this, this thing you did, it, it's going to potentially break, you need to look at this, or maybe I rewrite it automatically, that helps people migrate. So I think that's, uh, you know, the, the going to Dottie, that's one of the things that, that uh, uh, Martin has uh, high hopes for is, is migration tools. And, I've, and <clears throat> it, I did want to talk a little bit about Scala language itself because one of the main concerns I heard uh, at the first Scala Center Advisory Board meeting was they were worried about migrating to Dottie, all of our code base, because Dottie's sort of the incubator for new ideas for Scala for the future. And there's potentially breaking change, a lot of, lot of them, right? So how is that going to be managed? And um, what, I've, what I've drawn a picture of here is from my perspective, from the perspective of the community, what we would like to happen is that Dottie is down here uh, as a, you know, it's a way to try out ideas, right? But they actually have releases. So there's, there is kind of a competition going on for users in a way that would, you could think is like splitting the community. That's the thing. We don't want to split the community. But, um, and then as, as that, but you need to actually have users for Dottie if it's ever going to become the, the compiler, the, the code base for the compiler for Scala someday. And what uh, the top is, is the current NSC Scala compiler that's being uh, primarily supported by Lightbend. And from release to release, they are already starting to take things from Dottie. So ideas that are, are, that are non-controversial or that are low-hanging fruit, they move over, right? So as, and, I, and that just that there's one Scala. So Scala Scala is, is NSC, that's Scala. And it keeps progressing. It takes borrowing ideas from Scala so they get closer and closer. 
And, and in the meanwhile, Stadi is actually going to have to have releases so they can get users so it could become production worthy. And if it if these get and if it becomes production worthy enough, which is a long that's a lot that's hard to actually get it close enough to Scala, then you could actually at some day switch out and make Scala three be that code base. Uh, but that it needs to be farther enough in the future where that's also a pretty small hop. Because I think what, what's important is that each little hop is not that great. And, and you don't have this big, painful upgrade because a lot of people may not upgrade if you have that. You have to have little hops. So, OK. So the last thing I wanted to say is that uh, I think just this is my philosophy is I, I really do think we sh you know, we, if we're, we should try to make it as good as we can imagine it and just find some way to get people there in, in a uh, you know, a way that's reasonable. And um, so that's, that's all I actually had. So I have a little bit of maybe five minutes. Do I have any time for questions? I think I just went my 30 minutes. OK. So yes, anybody have a question or, or a uh, comment? <laughs> Even Miles can't think of a question. That's so that's, <laughs> I, I stumped you, yes. All right, well. Uh, oh, uh. I did have a question on your open book. You forgot what it was? Uh, all right, well, no questions. Um, do you have somebody between Jamie and me? or are you, Did you finish your slides, Jamie? I can keep talking a little bit if you. OK, he's ready. Yeah, that would give him good. more time. We are, I have a quick message for, from the staff. And okay.